So I disagree. I disagree with the distinction between intersubjectivity and empathy. I think empathy is a private case of intersubjectivity. And I also disagree with Morris and others that in the absence of communication of emotion, there's no empathy. Because you could empathize with non-emotional states of being. So empathy is not about emotions. It's about existence. It's about being. What is it that we feel in empathy? Do we feel our emotions? Do we feel, do we experience our sensations provoked by an external trigger, which is classic intersubjectivity? Or do we experience some kind of magical, enchanted transfer of another person's objects, another person's feelings, and another person's sensations to us? Do we see someone, he triggers us, and then we experience our own emotions and sensations? Or that person transfers to us emotions and sensations? Which of the two? Well, let's start with the basics. A transfer from one person to another is physically impossible, as far as we know. So, following Sherlock Holmes, uh, if you deem something impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So if it's impossible for one person to transfer feelings, emotions, sensations to another person, it means that empathy takes place 100% inside. It's an internal phenomenon. It has very little to do with anything external or anyone external. The other person just triggers in us a cascade of emotions, cognitions, sensations, feelings. It's a trigger. Empathy is, the, is a set of reactions, emotional and cognitive. It's reactions to being triggered by an external object, by the other. It is the equivalent of resonance in the physical sciences or flashbacks in PTSD. But we have no way of ascertaining that the wavelength of such resonance is identical in both subjects. Do we really know the frequency of another person? Do we know what another person is feeling? Do we know the subjective experience of a specific emotion in another person? We have no way to verify that the feelings, emotions, sensations or even cognitions invoked and evoked and provoked and elicited in two subjects are the same. I don't know if my subjective experience of the color red is your subjective experience of the color red. When we use the word red, are we talking about the same thing? And this is the color red, which is a, an objective um, light frequency, light wave frequency. Imagine when we talk about love, or hatred, or repulsion. These are compounded, multifaceted schemas of, of everything, cognitions, emotions, values, experiences, memories, thoughts, identity, cultural and social mori. They all interfere and intervene and compose and recompose and recombine and everything to yield, to yield sadness. When you're telling me I'm sad, and I'm telling you, I'm sad too. Are we talking about the same thing? Is there an, a procedure? Is there a test? Is there an experiment we can conduct that we tell us that what I call sadness is what you call sadness? No. The answer is no. Colors, for instance, have unique, uniform, independently measurable properties. The energy. And even so, no one can prove that what I see as black is what another person would call black. A, Dal a Daltonist, a colorblind person, uses the word black, but what he means when he says black is not what I mean. If this is true with colors, which are objective measurable phenomena, it is infinitely more true in the case of emotions and feelings. And we are forced, therefore, to refine the definition Let's try again. 
Empathy is a form of intersubjectivity, which involves living things as objects, to which the communicated intersubjective agreement relates. It is the intersubjective concomitant experience of being. The empathor, the person who empathizes, empathizes not only with the empathy's emotions, but also with his physical state and other parameters of existence, such as pain, hunger, thirst, suffocation, sexual pleasure, but the meaning attributed to the words used by both of us, by the empathor and the empathy, the meaning attributed to the words, the meaning, the meaning attached to the intersubjective agreement known as empathy, the meaning is totally dependent upon each party. There is no dictionary. There can never be a dictionary between two people. Minds are inaccessible. Minds are firewalled by definition. I can never enter your mind. I have to rely 100% on what you report to me. If you tell me I'm sad, you may be faking. I have no way of knowing. I have no way of proving it. Not even with a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. Because you can fake that too. There's no way, no known way, to establish with 100% certainty what's happening in your mind. And moreover, even if tomorrow we invent a machine that shows conclusively that when you say you, that you're sad, you're not lying and you're really sad, how you experience your sadness, the subjective experience, the introspective experience of sadness, I can't prove that it's the same for you as it is for me. The same words are used, the same denotates, but it cannot be proven that the same connotates, the same experiences, same emotions and sensations uh, are being discussed or communicated. We are lying to ourselves. We, are, we create a, a, a lexical dictionary convention. We say, listen, let's agree that the word sadness means the same for you as it, as it does to me, as, as it does for me. Let's agree that your love is my love, which is the source of a lot of misunderstanding in many couples. They use words which describe emotions and even cognitions, and they don't agree on a common dictionary. And why they don't agree on a common dictionary? Because it's impossible to do it. This is impossible to accomplish. Even if I put two members of a couple a man and a woman, and they talk for the next 80 years, they discuss for the next 80 years, what is the meaning of love? It would still be something extraneous. They would still not be discussing the experience of love. How does she experience love? How does he experience love? The physiological manifestations may be the same. Heartbeat, blood pressure, pupil dilation. But that's it. What's the subjective experience? What does love mean to her in the deepest, most profound sense? How does he go through love? How does he become through love? There's no way to communicate this. We are utterly isolated, solipsistic islands. We are sheep passing at the night, in the night and and we blow our fog horns and we call this love and communication. And then we are gone. Then we are gone. Language and by extension art, culture, they serve to introduce us to other points of view. What is it like to be someone else? To paraphrase, to paraphrase Thomas Nagel. By providing a bridge between the subjective inner experience and the objective words, images, sounds, Language facilitates social exchange and interaction. It's useful. It is a dictionary which translates one's subjective private language to the coin of the public medium. Knowledge and language are thus the ultimate social glue, though both are based on approximations, guesses, and frankly, lies, confabulations. I refer you to George Steiner's After Babel. I had the privilege of spending three years with him in Geneva. Amazing intellectual. True intellectual. Old-fashioned type. Old school. Whereas the intersubjective agreement regarding measurements and observations concerning external object 
is verifiable or falsifiable using independent tools. So when we talk about objective things, we can conduct lab experiments, we can conduct studies, and we can reach an intersubjective agreement on the size of this laptop. We can even to some extent reach an intersubjective agreement on how big Sam Vaknin's nose is. But can we reach a true intersubjective agreement about whether my nose is ugly? About how you feel about my nose? What sensations my nose gives you when it's used appropriately? Your emotions, your experiences? Can you communicate this? Of course not. None of these are verifiable or falsifiable using independent tools. I cannot con construct a laboratory experiment to tell me how, how, really you, how you really feel about my nose. And even if you report how you feel about my nose, I don't know how it feels to you. The interpretation of empathy, this second kind of intersubjective agreement, is dependent upon introspection. Upon introspection, it's an assumption that identical words used by different subjects still possess identical meaning, and it's a fallacious. This assumption is not falsifiable or verifiable. It's totally fallacious. It's neither true nor false. It has no truth value. It is a probabilistic statement, but without probability distribution or actually even a probability object. It's a meaningless statement to say what I feel is what you feel, what I think is what you think. Mean, this is a meaningless, these are meaningless statements. Empathy, therefore, is meaningless. It's meaningless because it relies on a confabulation of communication. It relies on a total misunderstanding. It relies on confusing, confusing words with essence, confusing reports with experience. Confusing objective with subjective. No one can access your subjective world. You are trapped. You are trapped there. And no one can ever get to you. We are all hostages of our minds. We are the ghosts in our own machines. In human speak, if you say that you are sad and I empathize with you, it means that we have an agreement. I regard you as my object. You communicate to me a property of yours, sadness. And this communication triggers in me a recollection of what is sadness or what it is to be sad. I say that I know what you mean. I say that I know how you feel because I have been sad before. I know what it is like to be sad. I empathize with you. We agree about being sad. We have an intersubjective agreement. But alas, such an agreement is meaningless. We cannot yet measure sadness, quantify it, crystallize it, pulverize it, access it in any way from the outside, measure it, and most importantly, experience it. We are totally and absolutely reliant on your introspection and my introspection. There is no way anyone can prove that my sadness is even remotely similar to your sadness. I may be feeling or experience something that you might find hilarious and not sad at all. This happens a lot, by the way. Someone is communicating some tragic experience and, and someone else finds it very funny. Still, I call it sadness and I empathize with you. Regardless of the, of the internal content. Encyclopedia Britannica. Young children's growing awareness of their own emotional states, characteristics, and abilities leads to empathy. In other words, the ability to appreciate the feelings and perspectives of others. Empathy and other forms of social awareness are in turn important in the development of a moral sense. Another important aspect of children's emotional development is the formation of their self-concept or identity, their sense of who they are and what their relation to other people is. According to Lipp's concept of empathy, a person appreciates another person's reaction by a projection of the self onto the other. In his book, as Aesthetic, Aesthetic, it's a German book, published between 1903 and 1906, he made all appreciation of art 
dependent upon a similar self-projection into the object. He said that when you empathize with someone, you project yourself into someone. Similarly, when you see a work of art, you project yourself into the work of art. This may well be the key. Empathy has little to do with the other person, the empathy. Empathy is simply the result of conditioning, of socialization. We are taught empathy. In other words, when we hurt someone, we don't experience his pain. We experience our pain. We project ourselves. Hurting somebody hurts us. The reaction of pain is provoked in us by our own actions, including the act of observation. We have been taught a learned response, a conditioned response, operant conditioning, of feeling pain when another person is in pain, and also when we inflict pain. But we've also been taught to feel responsible for our fellow beings. This is guilt, Judeo-Christian guilt, Nietzsche would say. So we are taught two things. We are taught to appropriate other people's experiences as ours. In other words, to experience our, our pain, for example, our sadness, and mislabel it. And say, it's not I who, who is sad, it's he, he is sad. It's not I um, who is in pain, she is in pain. We misappropriate other people's emotions, states, like pain, hunger, thirst, and then we attribute these to, our, to ourselves. We mislabel, we mislocate, we dislocate. And the second thing, we have been taught to feel responsible for what happens to other people via guilt and conscience. So we experience pain or any other state whenever another person claims to experience it as well. We feel guilty. And when the emotion is positive, we feel responsible somehow. Very often we meet someone and they're happy and he's, she's happy. And unconsciously we would, tell, we would say to ourselves, I had something to do with it. I had something to do with it even if I only share this happiness. Just share, sharing is caring, you know. Sharing also makes her happy. So her happiness is multiplied by sharing. Um, and this is a social instinct. It's nothing to do with psychology. It's a social conditioning, part of socialization. So when we see another person, there are two processes immediately, two reactive processes that start immediately. Another person's presence, just the fact that he's there and breathing, triggers two processes. Process number one, we appropriate, we steal from him, we, we confiscate his emotions, his facial expressions, his body language, his, his um, everything. And we emulate, we imitate, we mold ourselves, we shape shift to become him. Numerous experiments have demonstrated that body language is contagious. When someone crosses legs, you cross legs. It's a fact. When re someone repeats a certain word a lot of times, you repeat the same word a lot, much more. These are facts. Social behavior is contagious. So that's the first thing. We appropriate these emotions, these states of being, and we attribute them to ourselves. We steal them, in effect. It's shop other lifting, <laughs> like shoplifting. So this is the first thing. And then we mistakenly say, his sadness is my sadness, so I'm experiencing sadness. Second thing, we feel responsible. If the emotion is negative, the other's emotion is negative, we feel guilty. What did we do? If the other's emotion is positive, we feel that by sharing it, we are amplifying it. We are giving back to him his emotion. We are like mirroring or reflecting the emotion, thereby amplifying it. You know, when you shine a light to a mirror, it's amplified. We can use mirrors to amplify light. We can use this process of mirroring to amplify happiness. In sum, to use the example of pain, we experience pain in tandem together with the other person because we feel guilty. 
we feel somehow responsible for his condition. A learned reaction is activated and we experience our kind of pain as well. We communicate it to the other person and an agreement of empathy is struck between us. He is in pain, I resonate, it triggers my pain or a recollection of my pain. I communicate to him this recollection and this resonance and we have an agreement now about pain. Pain, its nature, its experience and its very existence. We attribute feelings, sensations and experiences to the object of our actions. It is the psychological defense mechanism of projection. He was right, this guy, the German guy I quoted before. He was right, Lip. We do project. Unable to conceive of inflicting pain upon ourselves, we displace the source. So there's, there's a, someone with pain. We look at him. We observe him. It triggers pain in us. But inflicting pain on ourselves is no, no. It's taboo. It's wrong. It's pathological. So we say, well, the pain we are feeling, it was not self-inflicted. It was imported from the other guy. It was transferred from the other guy to me. I'm experiencing his pain, not my pain. I'm defending, defending against the realization that I'm the one who is causing pain to myself. I'm acting in a way mini, micro suicidally. Apropos mini. Hello. Ah, where would I be without her? She's my liquidity. So this is again a second layer of confabulation. The first layer of confabulation, we can experience what other people what other people experience. Wrong. Second level of confabulation. An emotion is triggered in us, but we attribute this emotion to someone else, to the other. We say we got this emotion from him by contagion. He infected us with his emotion. I appropriated his emotion. It's another confabulation. It's not true. The emotion is ours. The emotion I feel when I see someone sad is my sadness, not his sadness. The Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica. Perhaps the most important aspect of children's emotional development is a growing awareness of their own emotional states and the ability to discern and interpret the emotions of others. The last half of the second year is a time when children start becoming aware of their own emotional states, characteristics, abilities, and potential for action. This phenomenon is called self-awareness. I must add that it is coupled with strong narcissistic behaviors and traits, primary narcissism. Coming back to the Brita Encyclopedia Britannica, this growing awareness of an ability to recall one's own emotional states, one's own emotional states, leads to empathy or the ability to appreciate the feelings and perceptions of others. Young children's dawning awareness of their own potential for action inspires them to try to direct or otherwise affect the behavior of others. With age, children acquire the ability to understand the perspective or point of view of other people, a development that is closely linked with the empathic sharing of other people's emotions. One major factor underlying these changes is the child increasing cognitive sophistication. For example, in order to feel the emotion of guilt, a child must appreciate the fact that he could have inhibited a particular action of his that violated the moral standard. The awareness that one can impose a restraint on one's own behavior requires a certain level of cognitive maturation, and therefore the emotion of guilt cannot appear until that competence is attained. That empathy is a reaction to external stimuli that is fully contained within the empathor, the person who empathizes, and then projected onto the empathy is clearly demonstrated by inborn reflexive empathy. It is the ability to exhibit empathy and altruistic behavior in response to facial expressions. Newborns react this way to mother's facial expression of sadness or distress. And the fact that newborns can react 
can imitate, can emulate mother's facial expressions six hours after they're born. Six hours after they're born, they turn their head to follow mother. And within four months, they imitate expressions. This serves to prove that empathy is very little to do, very little to do with the feelings, experiences, or sensations of the others, of the other, like the empathy. The, the child at age four months, when he is already clearly empathic, does not perceive the existence of other people as separate. He does not perceive other people as autonomous, independent entities. He has a unitary view of the universe. He is the world, like the famous rock, rock song. You know, we are the world. The child regards himself, he, the child is so expansive, he regards himself as the world, he and the world are one. He, there's no concept of me and others. So where does the empathy come from? If it crucially depends on feeling another person, experiencing another person, sensing another person, and on the feeling, experiences, and sensations of other people, how does it manifest at age four months? Surely the infant has no idea what it is like to feel sad. Definitely not what it is like for his mother to feel sad. In this case, it is a complex, complex reflexive reaction. Later on, empathy is still rather reflexive, the result of conditioning. Empathy, therefore, technically, is a form of psychosis. What is psychosis? In psychosis, we have hyperreflection. The, the self of the psychotic expands to include the world. And as it includes the world, the psychotic confuses internal objects with external. He thinks that his internal objects are actually outside himself. They're external. This confusion, he has a voice in his head. It's an interject. He hears it coming from the corner of the room. There's an image in his head. He sees it standing there. He confuses, he kind of projects his internal objects to the outside. And that's what we do in empathy. We actually, empathy is a totally self-contained internal process. It is triggered by the presence of another person. So there's another person. That other person triggers a cascade of emotions and cognitions inside and memories inside us. This cascade is totally, totally internal. It involves only internal objects, only internal emotions, only self-generated internal cognitions, only. It has nothing to do with the external object. And yet, Anyway, and yet, we make we are confused. We make the mistake of thinking that these emotions and cognitions come from the other person, not from us. Everything happens inside, but we think it comes from the outside. This is an excellent definition of psychosis. Everything happens inside, but we think it's coming from the outside. That's what a psychotic would tell you. It's coming from the outside. Empathy is the same. It happens inside, but we misperceive it as coming from the outside. So empathy is a form of psychosis. The Encyclopedia Britannica quotes fascinating research, which dramatically proves the object independent nature of empathy. In other words, that it's a totally internal process. Empathy is an internal reaction triggered by external, an external cue provided by animate objects. It is communicated to the empathy, other, by the empathor. But the communication and the resulting agreement, I know how you feel, I know how you feel, therefore we agree on how you feel, this resulting agreement is rendered meaningless by the absence of a monovalent, unambiguous dictionary. And so the Britannica says, an extensive series of studies indicated, indicated that positive emotion feelings enhance empathy and altruism. In other words, when we feel good, when we're happy, when we're in a good mood, we are much more empathic. By the way, when we had just exercised physically, we are much more empathic. When we are sick, 
ill physically, we are less empathic. Empathy depends critically on what's happening to us, not on anyone outside. It's a totally internal thing that reacts to our state of mind and, and to our health and to our to exercise and to neurotransmitters and to hormones. It's totally, totally internal thing. And yet we keep saying, no, it's not internal. It's external. I'm empathizing with him. I'm empathizing with her. I feel bad for him. I feel good for her. They have nothing to do with it. It's psychotic to claim otherwise. Britannica continues, it was shown by the American psychologist Ellis M. Eisen, I-S-E-N, that relatively small favors or bits of good luck, like finding money in a coin telephone or getting an unexpected gift, this kind of serendipitous events or small favors or, or some small gift, they induce positive emotion in people and that such emotion regularly increased the subject's inclination to sympathize, to empathize, to provide help. Several studies have demonstrated that positive emotion facilitates creative problem solving. One of these studies showed that positive emotion enabled subjects to name more uses for common objects. Another study showed that positive emotion enhanced creative problem solving by enabling subjects to see relations among objects and among other people. And these relations between objects would have gone unnoticed otherwise. Positive psychology, positive emotionality, positive experiences like gifts, positive, positive everything makes you much more empathic. And what is empathy? Empathy is observation of a trigger and then whole networks inside you come to life. Empathy and livings makes you come alive. That's why people seek connection. That's why they want friendship. That's why they socialize. Britannica continues, a number of studies have demonstrated the beneficial effects of positive emotion on thinking, memory, and action in preschool and older children. But if empathy increases with positive emotion, if empathy increases with good luck, with good mood, with exercise, then it has little to do with the alleged objects of empathy, with the other people. It has a lot to do with the person in whom the empathy is provoked. It's a lot to do with you. It's again about you. It's in a way narcissistic. Empathy is a narcissistic, psychotic defense. And that's the new way, a totally new way of looking at empathy.